Hello and welcome to Electromagnetics 1. Dr. Trample here. This is uh, lecture number 17. We're going to be talking about inductance. Well, what, what, ex what exactly is inductance? Um, inductance is a measure of how efficiently a structure stores energy in its magnetic field. So we talked um, previously in this course about capacitance and how capacitance is a measure of how efficiently um, a structure stores energy in its electric field. The dual of capacitance is inductance and it's to do with the, with the magnetic field. Um, let's look at this diagram here at the right. We've got a current that's flowing through um, a, a loop or, or a solenoid here and that current creates a magnetic field that uh, penetrates the penetrates the solenoid. Um, a circuit carrying current I produces a magnetic flux density B that produces a flux, capital Psi, that's equal to the surface integral of B dot dS. Okay. So first of all, um, this current creates a magnetic field in the loop. Um, and that, uh, that magnetic field uh, creates flux, um, which is defined in this way. Um, usually we're going to integrate, the, usually the surface is going to be um, the cross-sectional area of, of the loop. Okay. So the current produces a magnetic field, the magnetic field produces a flux, and that flux passes through each uh, each turn, turn or each of the loops in, in the coil as shown here. If the circuit has n identical turns, we can define the flux linkage lambda as just simply n times um, the flux. So you can think of psi as the flux linked by one loop and lambda is the flux linked by all n loops. In a linear medium, medium, the flux linkage lambda is proportional to the current I uh, producing it. Okay, In other words, lambda is equal to sum L times I, where the constant of proportionality L is called the inductance of the circuit. So the relationship, uh, I should say the coefficient that tells you um, the relationship between the flux linkage and the current is the inductance. In other words, L is the ratio of um, lambda to I. How does that relate to how efficiently um, a particular structure stores energy in its magnetic field? Well, um, you can think of it this way. The bigger the inductance L, the more flux you're going to get per unit current. That's, that's how, I th how I think about it. So a structure with larger inductance actually links more flux um, for the same amount of current uh, that a structure with smaller in inductance would. So it's, it's, it's a measure of, of efficiency. Well, let's, let's see if we can calculate the inductance uh, for a couple of common uh, geometries here. The first one that we want to study is is a solenoid, which is just um, a, a a big coil that has a whole bunch of, of different loops. You're seeing here in this figure um, the the current is coming um, out of the board on the left hand side and back in on the right hand side here. Uh, the solenoid has a radius of a, and um, those currents create and a length, I should say, a height l. Those currents create a um, magnetic field here that creates a magnetic flux density B in the center. Okay, um, so P is right here at the center of the loop, and this is a finite solenoid, so it, it has a finite length L. That's important to understand. How in the world are we going to figure out what the magnetic field is here? Okay, um, uh, it may be shown that the magnetic field H along the axis above a of a circular loop of radius A, a distance Z above the center is given by this expression. So this is the magnetic field 
due to just a single loop. Okay, so just a, if you have a single loop that has a current i um, i prime in it, um, it creates a magnetic field that looks like this if you are on the axis of the loop. Okay, at some distance z above the, the axis of the loop. So this is not the magnetic field produced by this solenoid. This is the magnetic field produced by a single loop that contains current i prime. Okay. Now, once you know, you can, by the way, I leave this as an exercise to you to derive this expression using um, the bios of our law. That's, that's what you need to do in order to get this expression. Okay, now, once you have uh, the magnetic field due to a single loop, you're in a position to figure out what the magnetic field due to a whole bunch of stacked loops like, like a solenoid is. If we treat an inc incremental length dz, of the solenoid as an equivalent loop composed of capital N over L where capital N is the number of um, loops and L is the height dz turns so if you take that number times dz you get the number of turns um, that carries a current current I prime which is again I n over L dz the induced field right here at a point P in the center is um, due to this little differential height is this differential magnetic flux density is equal to mu n i a squared over 2 a squared plus z squared to the 3 halves power times dz in the z hat direction. All we're doing in order to get that essentially is just um, saying that uh, our the, the number of turns is equal to this okay and the current I prime has this uh, expression, okay, is given by this expression. But this expression here comes right from um, this expression for the field due to a single, uh, the field of a single loop at a particular height h, okay, at a particular height z. Similarly, this differential field is due to a little, um, you, you can think of it like a, a filamentary loop of height delta z right here. And that this, this, um, this little loop uh, creates a differential uh, magnetic field right here at p, okay, given by this expression right here. Well, if you want to know the total magnetic field b, you need to integrate over the entire height of the loop then. And that's what we do uh, the next step, uh, but you need a trig substitution in order to do that. That's where all these thetas are coming from. So if you let z be equal to a tangent of theta and you further let um, this distance here, uh, the square of this distance, a squared uh, plus z squared, uh, be equal to a secant squared theta, and that means dz is a uh, secant squared theta. Um, d theta. There should be a, a d theta on there also. Then you can do a change of variables and um, integrate from now. Instead of integrating from uh, over, over dz, over the height of this uh, solenoid, what you're going to do is you're going to integrate over an angle. Okay, um, So uh, th uh, theta is just simply the angle made uh, by a vector that points from the origin up to whatever differential um, height is uh, is is being integrated over essentially. So theta just this vector just points here up to dz, and so theta is just simply that angle. So in order to uh, integrate over the entire height, what you have to do then is integrate starting from the bottom. That corresponds to angle theta one up to the top that corresponds to angle theta two. All right, so that's what we're doing right here. A um, whole bunch of things will cancel and simplify here. Um, you're going to get a one over secant um, integration. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll be integrating over one over secant, which is uh, uh, cosine. And so integral of, of, of cosine is uh, sine. And so that's where these signs uh, come from was when you do this integration. And so when you finally, when you do that, you finally arrive at an expression for the magnetic flux density um, at the center 
of a, of a finite length solenoid. It's given by this expression right here. Conveniently, if you want to know what the uh, magnetic field due to a sol solenoid of infinite length is, you just simply set theta, theta 2 equal to positive 90 degrees and theta 1 equal to um, negative 90 degrees, or I should say 90 degrees also. They, they both go to 90 degrees and um, uh, you, when you uh, take, uh, take into account the sine of 90 degrees here and the sine of 90 degrees here, this expression, you get a factor of 2 and you just get um, this expression here. This is the magnetic flux density due to a solenoid of infinite length. Okay, So the basic process um, when you want to find inductance, we, we haven't found the inductance of this thing yet. All we've found is the magnetic field um, uh, in the center of the solenoid. If we want to find the inductance, we have to keep going. Um, the next thing we need to do is find the flux linking the solenoid. Uh, again, flux psi is uh, the integral, the surface integral of b dot ds. Okay? We're going to make the assumption that the magnetic field is um, constant over the, the cross section of the loop. So in other words, we're going to say that the magnetic field at this point off the axis is the same as the magnetic field on the axis over the entire cross section of the loop. Just makes the math easier. Okay. Um, if you make that assumption, you can come in here. Oops. If you make that assumption, you can substitute for B. This we're going to use the expression for B for the infinitely long solenoid here. Um, we're going to put that expression for B in here, and we're going to dot it with ds, which is in the z hat direction, uh, and integrate over the area of the loop, capital S. Um, and again, if this is all constant, you can pull it out of the integral, and you just get a factor of the area that comes out. So um, the flux linked by a, a single coil is equal to to this, okay? This expression right here. Um, but remember, we've got n loops. Okay, this is if this is the flux linked by a single loop. We need the flux uh, the flux linkage lambda, which is linked by all of them. So we have to multiply by a factor of n. So lambda is um, mu n squared i s over l, where s is the cross sectional area. And by definition, the inductance is the ratio of the flux linkage to the current. So that factor of capital I cancels out and voila, at last we have an expression for the inductance of a solenoid. Mu n squared, where n is the number of turns, uh, s is the cross-sectional area divided by um, L, where L is the, uh, the length. Okay. <coughs> Okay, let's, um, let's look at another problem now, which is, uh, we, let's say we would like to know the induct inductance of a coaxial transmission line right here. So again, this is the, this is the uh, run of the mill uh, coax that you may have in your house that carries cable or, or whatever. And we'd simply like to know, okay, if we have um, an inner conductor carrying a current I and an outer conductor carrying a current minus I, what is the inductance per unit length actually of this uh, coaxial transmission line? Um, as always, the first step is you need to figure out what the magnetic field is in the relevant region. So we really are just interested in the region in between the conductors right here, between uh, row equals A and, and row equals B. So from row, from row going from A to B. So just in between the, the two conductors. That's the region of interest for us. You can use um, Gauss's law or Ampere, Ampere's law. Excuse me. You can use Ampere's law to figure out. Okay, what is the uh, magnetic field due to an infinitely long um, current car uh, current carrying wire? And uh, I leave it as an exercise for you to show that um, the uh, magnetic field due to an infinitely long current wire current carrying wire. Uh, is equal to this expression right here. This is the magnetic flux density due to that. Mu i over 2 pi rho 
in the fee hat direction. So um, that makes a certain amount of sense. If I put my uh, finger in the direction of, excuse me, if I put my thumb in the direction of the current, then my finger is wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field. And that direction in cylindrical coordinates is the phi hat direction. So um, that's where this expression comes from. Okay. Next, we need to know the flux linked by, um, by, that, uh, by, by that area, essentially, by, by the coaxial transmission line. So we have to integrate that magnetic field over a particular um, cross-sectional surface area. In this case, we're going to be integrating over this little uh, uh, violet box right here, S. Okay, and, and so X S has length L and it has height um, B minus H. And we need to integrate. Remember, we need to integrate B. We're taking the integral of B dot dS. And so, again, um, in this case, dS is going to uh, point in the phi hat direction, okay, and um, it's going to be just simply phi hat um, d rho dz in this case, since we're integrating over um, uh, the, the 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 dz and the d rho variables. Um, B is not a function of z, so we can just simply do the dz integration from. Um, zero to L, and and that just gets us a, gives us a factor of L out front. Then we've got to deal with this integral here, which is over the row direction, which does uh, it, which is not constant, but it's easy. The integral, if you remember, of one over rho is just the natural log evaluated here up at B and A. That gets us the natural log of B divided by A, like that. In order to find the inductance, then um, we divide. Uh, the flux uh, here by both the length and um, the current. All right, so this is going to get us the uh, inductance per, per unit length, and we get a couple of constants that fall out. And the inductance per unit length of a coaxial transmission line turns out to be mu over two pi, where mu is just the um, the permeability of the medium in between the conductors, and uh, the natural log of uh, B over A, where one is the um, uh, those are those are those distances uh, given here. So that's the process. When you when you need to find inductance, the first thing you need to do is figure out what is the magnetic field in in the region of interest. Um, once you know that, you might you might need to use Ampere's law to do that. You might need to use the Biot-Savart law to do that, or some other some other sort of tool um, using. For instance, the uh, magnetic vector potential, and then taking the curl to find the magnetic um, uh, flux density B, et cetera. There's a number of ways of doing it. But anyway, somehow you need to find the magnetic field in the region of interest. Then you have to find the flux through that, that um, region of interest. And then you can um, uh, use these little formulas here to find uh, the inductance either per, per unit length or just simply the inductance L of the structure. Okay, thank you for your attention. We'll see you in the next lecture.